At this point, I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. If you're using one of the Bibles here in the auditorium, that can be found on page 660. 660, and also inside the bulletin, uh, there's a uh, sermon notes that you can take out and uh, use them as a guide as we work through these verses uh, together today. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about the subject matter of divorce, uh, not because it was the topic that I chose to talk about, it's just the next section in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And as we begin, uh, begin this morning, I want, to, I want to start with a little experiment, okay? In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if any of the following are true. So wait until you hear all the scenarios. Don't raise your hand after the first one. But after you hear all three scenarios, if any one of these are true, then raise your hand, okay? <laughs> so if any of, after you hear the, the three scenarios, if one of the following is true, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you have ever been divorced or if you are married to someone who's been divorced or if someone in your immediate family has been divorced. That would be your parents, uh, one or more of your brothers or sisters, any of your children or any of your grandchildren. If any of these are true for you, would you raise your hand right now? Okay, I wanna encourage you just to take a minute to look around the room. Keep your hands up. If any of those things are true, to look around the room. That this is a group of people who know something about divorce about how it affects relationships, about how the, the kind of deep pain and, and damage that can come from a marriage that doesn't end well. This is a group that knows that divorce doesn't just impact the husband and the wife. We know that the consequences ripple throughout the entire family. Thanks for uh, participating in the experiments and I think you figured out you could lower your hands now. Divorce is, has now become more common than it was in previous generations. In the early part of the 20th century, the divorce rate in the United States was approximately 0 0.9 per 1,000 total population. And throughout the 20th century, the divorce rate slowly increased then rose rapidly in the 1970s and 80s as many states passed no-fault divorce laws. No-fault divorce laws allow for divorce to be granted without any requirement to show that one party to the marriage has committed some wrongdoing that makes the marriage unworkable, such as committing adultery or deserting the family or treating your spouse um, with cruelty. In a no-fault divorce proceeding, one of the parties simply has to show that the marriage is no longer viable and is beyond repair without having to prove that the other party is responsible. You can simply say that we have irreconcilable differences and that will be sufficient. Specific requirements vary from state to state. You've probably heard the claim that 50% of marriages end in divorce today. Uh, this is a statistic that is sometimes repeated in popular uh, media reports, but to be honest, the claim, is, the claim is simply not true. According to a study conducted by Harvard-trained social uh, researcher and author Shanti Feldhahn, the overall divorce rate is closer, closer to 33%. Um, the, the divorce rate did peak in the early 1980s as approximately 5.0 uh, 5 per 1,000 total population, approximately 1.2 million divorces. Also, uh, after 1985, the divorce rate gradually declined so that in 2014, there were approximately 813,000 862 divorces or annulments in America, or 3.2 per 1,000 total population. But the number of divorces per 1,000 population has gone down 
primarily because many couples are now living together instead of getting married and more people are remaining single. So what is to be the Christian's attitude regarding divorce? Under what circumstances, if any, is it morally right to obtain a divorce and therefore dissolve a marriage? And if divorce does occur, is it ever morally right for a divorced person to marry someone else? Well, throughout church history, uh, Christians have traditionally held four different views on divorce and remarriage. Um, one view is that divorce is not permissible under any circumstances for any reason. A second view is that both divorce and remarriage are permissible for any reason. A third view is that divorce is permitted under certain circumstances, but remarriage is never permitted. The fourth view is that both divorce and remarriage are permitted under certain circumstances. The Bible, of course, actually teaches only one of these four possibilities. And that view is taught by Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, the passage that we will be looking at to, uh, together today. This morning, we are continuing our sermon series, Living Right Side Up in an Upside Down World, a study of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. In last week's passage, Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30, we saw that Jesus corrected the Pharisees' view on adultery, saying that if one lusted in his heart, he had already committed adultery. In today's text, Jesus corrects their permissive view of divorce. Essentially, the Pharisees legalized adultery by allowing themselves and others to simply get a divorce and remarry the person they, des they desired. Look with me at verse 31. Jesus says, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. When Jesus uttered these words, he was continuing to correct the Pharisees' misinterpretation and misrepresentation of the Old Testament law. In this case, Jesus was referring to Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, the only passage in the Old Testament which gave instruction about divorcing one's wife. It says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, and after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. Or if he dies, then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. The interpretation of this passage has be had become a matter of contention among the Jews. It all centered around the phrase, something indecent. The phrase can be translated, some shameful thing. In the first century, there were two schools of thought about this. The conservative school, led by Rabbi Shami, believed it referred to something sexual, but short of adultery. It couldn't refer to adultery, since adultery didn't result in divorce. It required capital, capital punishment under the Old Testament law. Rabbi Hillel taught the liberal view that it could refer to anything dissatisfying to the husband, including burning his dinner. <laughs> Rabbi Akaba, who also came from the liberal school of thought, taught that a husband could even divorce his wife if he found someone prettier. During Jesus' day, the predominant view was the liberal one that a husband could divorce his wife essentially for any reason at all. The only thing that was needed was an official divorce certificate. It was all about one's personal decision and the paper, as if a paper could truly dissolve a marriage. It was this 
misrepresentation of the law that Jesus was correcting. Now, we need to understand the certificate of divorce did not make divorce right, but only gave the woman some protection. It protected her from slander and relinquished the husband's, the husband's legal claim on the wife and gave her the freedom to remarry. An additional purpose of the certificate of divorce was to make the husband think long and hard about leaving his wife. He couldn't just leave her on a whim and then try to take her back later. Divorce had to be legal. Thus, this Old Testament law was meant to hinder divorce, not promote it. I, I realize that we have not yet looked at Jesus' response in verse 32, but it must be said that these two verses, Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, can hardly be thought to represent the sum total of Jesus' teaching on divorce. They, they seem to give a, an abbreviated summary of his teaching, of which, indeed, Matthew records a fuller version in chapter 19. So we would be wise to take the two passages together and to interpret the shorter in light of the longer. So please keep your finger here in Matthew 5, but turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. Again, if you're using one of our Bibles here in the auditorium, you can find that on page 671, page 671. Follow along as I read verses 3 through 8. Some Pharisees came to him, that is, Jesus, to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. The Pharisees hoped to trap Jesus by getting him to choose sides in this theological controversy regarding divorce. If Jesus were to choose sides in the controversy, some members of the crowd would dislike his position. For some may have used the Old Testament law to their advantage to divorce their wives. Or if he were to speak against divorce altogether, he would appear to be speaking against Moses. Notice that Jesus avoids the Pharisaic argument about reasons for divorce and goes back to the beginning of creation to demonstrate God's intention for the institution of marriage. God made people male and female. In marriage, he joins a man and a woman together in an inseparable bond. This bond is a higher calling than the parent-child relationship for a man is to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife in a one flesh relationship. Therefore, what God has joined together, men ought not separate. Jesus is saying in this passage that God's original intention for the human race was lifelong monogamous marriage. That is, husbands and wives were to, are to remain married for their entire lives. Or as the traditional marriage ceremony puts it, so long as you both shall live. That's why God said in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, I hate divorce. The Pharisees, realizing that Jesus was speaking of the permanence of the marriage relationship, asked why Moses commanded a husband under certain circumstances to give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus replied, Moses did not command you to divorce your wives. He permitted 
you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. Jesus' response should not be understood to imply that only hard-hearted individuals initiate divorce, but rather that as sinful individuals, our hard-hearted rebellion against God often leads to serious defilement of marriage. What, what are the biblical grounds for divorce, if any? Look at verse 9 here in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus says, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Turn back with me now to Matthew chapter 5. Again, page 660, if you're using one of the Bibles here in the auditorium. Matthew chapter 5, picking up with verse 32. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Did you notice that the language is very similar in both of those verses? So based on these two verses, we can see that Jesus permitted divorce and remarriage on one ground and one ground only, sexual immorality. The Greek word in both verses is pornea, from which we get the word pornography. It's a term that encompasses all sorts of sexual sins. Bible scholars differ over the meaning of this exception clause found only in Matthew's gospel. In the world of Jesus, pornea could refer to one of several things. It could, refer, it could be a synonym for adultery. It could refer to a sexual offense that occurred only in the betrothal period when a Jewish man and woman were considered married but had yet, yet not consummated their marriage with sexual intercourse. It could refer to an illegitimate marriage between near relatives, an incestuous relationship, or it could refer to a relentless, persistent, unrepentant lifestyle of sexual unfaithfulness, which is con contrasted from a one-time act of illicit relations. It seems to me that Jesus' reference to sexual immorality in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, involves this fourth definition of pornea, a relentless, persistent, unrepentant lifestyle of sexual unfaithfulness because such continued practice would have broken the marriage bond. When Jesus says that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, he implies the opposite as well. Divorce and remarriage on the ground of one's spouse's sexual immorality are not prohibited and do not constitute adultery. It is the one exception that Jesus makes to the requirement that marriage be lifelong. For sexual immorality seriously defiles and indeed disrupts the one flesh union between a husband and wife. Now, many Bible scholars agree that the Apostle Paul adds a second legitimate reason for divorce in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. I believe the verses should be up on the screen behind me. Paul says, to the rest I say this, I not the Lord. Let me just pause there for a minute and say that Paul is not saying what he has to say is more important than anything Jesus has had to say. He's saying, if you look at the verses just before this, he refers to something that Jesus specifically taught about. And now he's saying, I, I have something, a, a new context in which to apply Jesus' teaching. So he never taught on this, but I'm teaching on it. And Paul may have understood 
that when he was writing this letter to the Corinthians, that he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, what he had to say carried just as much authority as what Jesus had said. So anyways, Paul says, to the rest I say this, I, not the Lord, if any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Of course, brother or sister here is not talking about a biological relationship. It's talking about believers' relationships within the family of God. Um, the New Testament clearly teaches that Christians should only marry other Christians. Later in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, in verse 39, Paul informs a Christian woman whose husband has died that she is free to marry anyone she wishes with one stipulation. He must belong to the Lord. In other words, he must be a fellow believer. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? So if Christians are only to marry other Christians, why then would any Christian be married to a non-Christian? And I can think of at least three possibilities why this would happen. Number one, the husband and wife were both unbelievers when they got married. And then one of them subsequently became a believer at some point during the marriage while the other remained an unbeliever. I think this is the scenario that Paul most likely had in mind when he wrote his first letter to the church in Corinth. A second possibility is that the husband and wife both professed to be a believer when they got married, but over time, one of them proved by his words and actions that he or she was not a genuine believer. And a third possibility is that the believer willfully chose to marry an unbeliever in defiance to God's commands. In any case, when a believer has an unbelieving spouse, Paul says that they should remain married if the unbeliever is willing to do so. But if the unbelieving partner leaves the marriage, let it be so. The believer is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. Most Bible commentators believe that this implies the freedom for the believing spouse to obtain a legal divorce and to marry someone else. When an unbelieving spouse has deserted the marriage, God releases the believing spouse from the unending stress of a lifelong vain hope of reconciliation with an unbeliever who has left and a lifelong prohibition against enjoying the good blessings of a marriage again. So when we combine the teaching of Jesus with the teaching of Paul on this subject, it seems that there are two legitimate biblical grounds for divorce. Sexual immorality, as we saw Jesus talk about in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and chapter 19, verse 9, and desertion by an unbeliever, what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. Even in these two instances, however, divorce is not required or even encouraged. The most that can be said is that uh, sexual immorality and desertion are grounds or an allowance for divorce. Confession, forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration are always the first steps Divorce should only be viewed as a last resort. And that leads to a question that I suspect many of you have 
uh, certainly many Christians have had uh, over time, uh, are there any grounds for divorce beyond what the Bible says? The most frequent additional grounds for divorce that people tend to inquire about today are spousal abuse, child abuse, addiction to pornography, drug or alcohol abuse, crime or imprisonment, and mismanagement of finances, such as through a gambling addiction. But I have to say that none of these by themselves can be claimed to be explicit grounds for divorce. The Bible limits the grounds for divorce to sexual immorality and desertion by an unbelieving spouse. Um, to add to that is to add to the word of God. Um, but I'm going to talk about that more in a minute. So why does the Bible limit the grounds for divorce to just sexual immorality and desertion? Well, in marriage, a man and a woman commit to live with each other as husband and wife for life. And in order for them to keep this commitment both parties have to remain in the marriage. But when one party decides to leave the marriage for another partner or to just to leave the house altogether, it becomes impossible for the remaining spouse to faithfully fulfill his or her commitment. For example, a wife cannot live with and act as a wife to a husband who's living with another woman. Because of such cases, it seems that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God allowed for divorce in order to give some relief to the one spouse when the other has deserted the married or desecrated it by sexual immorality. With each of these other sins that people inquire about, as difficult as it may be, it is still possible for the husband or wife to fulfill his or her commitment within the context of marriage while addressing their spouse's sinful behavior and working toward healing and restoration of the marriage relationship. But you may still be thinking, yeah, but what about physical abuse? Should a wife who is being physically abused by her husband remain in that unsafe environment? No, of course not. Physical violence against a spouse is immoral and should not be tolerated by anyone. No one should remain in an unsafe environment, whether it involves a family member, a friend, an employer, a caregiver, a spouse, or a stranger. Physical abuse is also a crime. It's against the law and civil authorities should be the first ones contacted if abuse occurs. A spouse who is being abused should immediately seek a safe place. And if she reports the abuse to a friend, that friend or that family member should immediately help her to find a safe place, usually an undisclosed location to be. And if there are children involved, they should also be protected and removed from the situation. Placing a restraining order on the abusive husband may also be appropriate. There's nothing unbiblical about separating from an abuser. In fact, it's morally right to protect oneself and one's children. But can a victim of physical abuse divorce her husband? That depends. Each situation will be different. And a Christian involved in such difficult circumstances should seek wise counsel from the leaders of her church. This is my position on the matter. Where possible, the steps of church discipline outlined in Matthew chapter 18 should be followed in an attempt to bring a permanent end to the abuse and hopefully bring about reconciliation in the marriage. Once separation has been established, the abusive husband has the responsibility to seek help. 
Repentance should be accompanied by intensive counseling with a trusted pastor or biblical counselor. The counseling should be taken first individually, then as a couple, and finally as an entire family, as all need help healing. I do believe that change is possible for an abusive husband who is truly willing to repent and humbly surrender his life to God. However, if he is unwilling to seek help and the church discipline process results in the final step of excommunication, then I believe that it would be appropriate to treat the abusive husband as an unbeliever. And church leadership can then put a healthy amount of pressure on the unbelieving husband to either get help or to leave the marriage. And if he chooses to leave, divorce becomes biblically permissible. When is remarriage biblically permissible? Again, in verse 32, Jesus says that the husband who wrongfully divorces his wife makes her a victim of adultery. Because in that society, it was assumed that a divorced woman would usually need to marry someone else for financial support and protection. And yet Jesus still says that the new relationship is at least initially adultery because there was not a proper reason for the divorce. But Jesus places most of the blame on the husband who wrongfully divorced her, saying that he thereby makes her a victim of adultery. If a divorce is obtained for any reason other than sexual immorality or desertion, then the second marriage begins with adultery. The phrase marries a divorced woman implies that the second marriage, though it begins with adultery, is still a legitimate marriage. Once a second marriage has occurred, it would be further sin to break it up. The second marriage should not be thought of as a continually living in adultery, for the man and woman are now married to each other, not to anyone else. If the exception, sexual immorality or desertion occurs, then the implication that remarriage to another does not constitute adultery and is therefore permissible. It's important to note that, the, that only the innocent party is allowed to, to remarry. Although not stated in the text, it would seem the allowance for remarriage after divorce is God's mercy for the one who has been sinned against, not for the one who committed the offense. There may be instances where the guilty party is allowed to remarry, but if there are, they're not mentioned in this text. One, one instance where it may be permissible for the guilty party to remarry is when the offense occurred prior to becoming a believer. Because for the new Christian, Paul says the old has passed and all things have become new. So God may very well permit uh, the husband or wife in this case to remarry as long as the new spouse belongs to the Lord. I want to I wanna conclude our time together around God's word this morning by, by giving hope to those who may have experienced a divorce in their past. First of all, if you have experienced a, a heart-wrenching divorce, and divorce was not what you wanted, maybe you will find some comfort in the words expressed by the divorcee in this video. Okay. All right. Well, uh, my name is Mickey and my husband and I met back in the 1970s, a long, long time ago. We were both college students at the time and we had mutual friends. When we met, it was like, yes, this is an exciting thing. We both love Jesus. So it was going to school. It was raising children, working in a church. It was very, very intense. Our schedules were crazy. And that's when things sort of started going south for us. And what started happening was that my husband, with his busy schedule, began to be less and less present with us as a family. 
and there were things that were being said by him to me, don't tell anybody that I'm not here that often. You know, don't talk to anybody. And whatever you're feeling is not as valid because what I'm feeling is more powerful and so therefore my feelings are more valuable than your feelings. And those three signs are really essential. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. That is a symbol, that is a real sign of dysfunction that's going on. When I said, we need to get help, he said, no, you're too sick. You need to divorce me because my reputation is at stake. That was the most devastating moment of my life. And at the same time, it was the most freeing spiritually. Because all of a sudden, all I had was God. To this day, my ex-husband has never come to me and said, I'm sorry for what I did. But that didn't keep me from having to be able to forgive him. I've already forgiven. Forgiveness is very available. When you live in a land where forgiveness is available, you're living in God's world. Because God made forgiveness available through Jesus Christ on the cross. I just wish that our marriage had been different. But I want you to know that God is always there whether you recognize him or not. And even in this time of really, really deep pain and sorrow, you can reach out. Now, you don't have to have follow some kind of perfect formula. Just be yourself because God is there. He is the creator. He's the one who made you. He knows you. He knows that this is what you're going through. And the God of the universe cares enough about you to say, please, just reach out. I'm ready. If you've suffered through a divorce, I want you to know that the church, Christ's body, this church, Perryville Bible Church is here for you and wants to provide you with the love and the comfort and the support you need, whether the divorce happened in the last year or many years ago and you're still suffering the consequences of that. Second, if you've experienced an illegitimate divorce, one that was not permissible according to biblical standards, and, and you've now remarried, you may be thinking, what, what hope is there for me? Well, here's what I would say, that if you and your spouse are, are believers, I would encourage you to get together and to just confess that that relationship as it was initiated was sinful in God's sight and to ask him for forgiveness. But then, knowing that he promises to forgive you and not hold that sin against you any longer, you are free to ask for his blessing on your current marriage. And then strive to make your current marriage a good and lasting one with Jesus at the very center of your relationship. Divorce is as hurtful and destructive today as it was in Jesus' day. And I trust that you saw in today's message that Jesus was not primarily talking about what makes divorce permissible. He was talking about the sanctity of marriage. God intends marriage to be a lifelong commitment. And married couples should never consider divorce an option for solving problems or as a way out of a relationship that seems dead. Rather, married couples should seek to resolve their relational conflicts biblically. And when the husband and wife both understand and acknowledge that God created marriage to be a sacred and permanent union between a man and a woman and choose never to use the word divorce in their interactions with one another. They can provide security for one another, a stable home for their children, and strength to weather life's storms and stresses. Let's pray. Father, this was a, a difficult passage for me to preach on today, not because what you've said in your word is unclear, but because I suspect that there are many people today who have experienced the pain of divorce in one way or another. 
And to even talk about this subject just opens up old wounds. And if there's somebody here today that is in that position, I pray that you would comfort them where they're at. That you would give them hope. And uh, whether it was a, a marriage that um, both the husband and wife mutually decided that it should end, or one in which one party decided it was over and the other didn't really want it to end. Lord, you can bring healing to those wounds. And wherever the divorcee is today, Lord, you can take them where they're at and, and, and work in their life again, to bring healing to them. If they're in a new marriage, Lord, you can bless that marriage and, uh, and work in their lives to make that marriage the best it can be for your glory. Wherever people are today, Lord, would you just minister to them in their need? But help us, Lord, to be men and women who choose to live according to your word. It's one thing to mentally assert that yes, these things are true and yet choose to just live our lives contrary to what your word teaches and willfully do it. And I pray that now that we have a better understanding of this uh, particular subject matter that we would choose going forward that we would think about, talk about and live out our lives regarding this subject matter in a way that would bring honor and glory to you and help us to effectively minister to others who are dealing with a similar situation. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.